Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to organizing in the time of COVID-19. My name is Firoz Manji. I am from Daraja Press. Uh, today, we're going to be talking with two really interesting uh, women who are part of the Alliance of uh, Middle Eastern and North African Socialists. The, uh, the COVID pandemic, really compels us to to uh, create a global movement uh, that addresses the connections between all different aspects of our life. I think one of the things COVID is doing is helping us to understand the nature of the kind of societies that we we live in. And and uh, the uh, the two people we'll be talking to um, want to, you know, have written about this uh, in, a, in, an, in an excellent uh, uh, article, which I would strongly uh, recommend uh, for, for everyone to, to, to read. And, and it tries to address the connections between prisons, refugee camps, racism, sexism, imperialism, and the inhumanity of the, of the capitalist uh, system. Um, so so I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased to to uh, um, introduce you to uh, 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 Frida Afari, who is a librarian, translator, is that right? Producer of Iranian progressives in trans translation, and also a member of the uh, Alliance of Middle Eastern and North African Socialists. Uh, Lara al Kateb is a Syrian gender studies researcher who works uh, on the Me Too movement and the liberation of political prisoners in the Middle East and North Africa region. She too is a member of the Alliance of Middle Eastern and North African Socialists. Um, and to protect her, uh, uh, protect her, uh, we've agreed that she doesn't show her, uh, her face on, on, on the video here. But warm welcome to you, Frida, and to you, Lara. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Um, Perhaps we could start with with you giving us some sort of idea uh, of the arguments and 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 essence of your the, of your paper. What is holding back the, the the formation of a global prison abolitionist movement? Um, what is holding it back? Well, well, sure, key question. Perhaps you can, Frida, you might start on that. Sure. So in the article which was published by a Spectre, a new uh, Marxist journal, we uh, argue that uh, the issue of uh, prisons and the carceral system being a mark of capitalism can be seen globally uh, in the very large prison populations in uh, first the US, uh, China, Russia, uh, Brazil, uh, and then um, in the uh, Middle East, uh, and, and, uh, Syria, in Iran, and uh, the uh, fact that uh, it is, it shows that uh, we need not, we should not be addressing the uh, prison abolition, abolitionism simply by focusing on one country but we need to address it as a global issue, as an issue that involves the coming together of capitalist authoritarianism, racism, sexism, homophobia. And that, uh, then we single out four uh, barriers that we think are really holding back the formation of, uh, of such a global, of a, of a needed global prison abolitionist movement. And those, we argue, are, are, are first the, the distinction between political prisoners and prisoners, that that's a false distinction, although there are distinctions, but we, we shouldn't make a class distinction between political prisoners and common prisoners. In the words of Romarilyn Ralston, who spoke at a panel we, uh, the Alliance sponsored on Sunday on global prison abolitionism, she said all prisoners are political prisoners because the reason they're in prison is political. It has to do with capitalism, racism, sexism, uh, the politics of the society, the laws of the society. So that's the first barrier. Second barrier is that 
we, uh, while, for instance, we focused on racism being a very strong component of the car source system in the U.S., we somehow sometimes don't extend that to other countries that have a large prison population, for instance, China with a million Uyghurs who are in prison, uh, or in other countries in the Middle East, of course, where uh, you have, uh, you have um, ethnic minorities uh, such as the Kurds. Uh, uh, in Iran, you have the um, Kurds and Arab uh, minority populations. Those are um, form large parts of the of the prison population. Uh, third is the question of women prisoners that uh, we argue that it should be seen as a feminist issue and a socialist feminist issue. There are a lot of women prisoners, although not as nearly as many as male prisoners, but the issue of women in prison, whether political prisoners or common prisoners, is should be a socialist feminist issue. And fourth, we argue is that uh, there is a problem of selective anti-imperialism in the left that uh, focused on uh, only U.S. imperialism and their, the carceral system that U.S. imperialism and the uh, states that are followers of U.S. imperialism impose. And they don't focus on other states, uh, other imperialist powers that claim to be anti-U.S. imperialism, but are also capitalist, authoritarian, and have large prison populations. For instance, China, Russia, and of course, uh, Syria, Iran, in, in the Middle East and North Africa region. So those are four of the barriers that we think a lot. And we think that if we address those issues, we can start to move towards a global prison abolitionist movement. I, and I think that uh, the last point you 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 make um, about uh, it's a weakness that I think has uh, come up in, in in the left a great deal, and that is as if uh, my enemy's enemy is my friend. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, it seems, especially in Syria, this has caused uh, huge problems in terms, of, particularly in terms of its the ability to provide solidarity to the. To the popular movement, uh, which has been ignored la largely, it seems. Um, but, but if I mean, it's quite right. You have all these uh, different uh, uh, incarcerations across uh, across the world. But is it not true that the U.S. also uh, proportionally has a, the, a huge proportion of the world's uh, um, incarcerated people? Frida. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you wanted Lara to answer. Yes, the U.S. has the largest prison population, 2.3 million, uh, which is enormous. And the next after that is China, which is uh, over 1 million, and uh, Russia with about 800,000, and then down from there with Brazil and India. Uh, so, yes, absolutely. We need to strongly focus on the United States and the coming together of capitalist authoritarianism, racism, and sexism in the US prison system. But we also need to look at it in a global way in order to, in order to actually have a stronger prison abolitionist system in the US, that not to make it weaker, but to actually make it stronger. I think the global view, uh, we both argue, of us argue is uh, that the global view would lead to a more effective U.S. prison abolitionist system. Um, Lara, I think one of the things that uh, struck me about the paper that you wrote was that that you made an important uh, point in in saying that we have to consider people who are in refugee camps, uh, people who are refugees, and the way in which they are. Uh, effectively incarcerated uh, and um, even uh, put in, in uh, things which polite society wouldn't call concentration camps, but I'm thinking of Gaza, for example. Um, and, and these are a very large proportion of the, those who have been uh, incarcerated. Um, could you give some sort of comments or your, your, your view about the 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 why refugee camps and so on should be considered as part of that uh, um, that incarcerated population. 
Um, absolutely. So in late 2019, a few months ago, actually, the Rohina camp in Bangladesh was set to be surrounded with barbed wires and a guard tower, basically turning the refugee camp into an open air prison. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there are a million Uyghur Muslims held in re-education camps uh, in China. There are 52,000 immigrants in detention centers across the US. So the racialized nature uh, and classist nature of refugee camps, of detention centers and prisons becomes evident. And this is one of the points we highlighted in our article. But more than that, what prisons and refugee camps is, uh, do is instill act separation. They separate families from each other, but also they separate people. They separate people considered unvaluable or um, unwanted, undesirable in society from people considered productive and normal to society. And so refugees and prisoners are taken away from everyday life. They're taken away from everyday sight. Nobody hears about them or sees them. They're locked in confinement in crowded areas without access to basic resource. And so this generates an ongoing cycle of poverty and low level crimes in order to maintain the status quo. This is how I see uh, both in my yes. Right, and, 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 and Frida mentioned in, in her intervention just a moment ago that, that we should consider uh, prisons as, 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 as a socialist feminist issue. Uh, uh, explain, what's your view on that, Lara? Well, it is a socialist feminist. It is also an anti-racist uh, issue. I believe that the future of all movements is when they intersect uh, globally, internationally, they become stronger. And I believe this is where future movements had, are heading into. Uh, but, but what particularly makes it a uh, socialist feminist issue? Uh, um... Handling the pandemic. Well, for example, I mean, when we talk about racism and in relation to to prisons, it's it's a disproportionate. Uh, uh, for example, in the U.S., and the same is true in the U.K., same is true in many other parts of the world. Disproportionate numbers of 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 African American Black mm -hmm. people being being imprisoned. Um, that's only one dimension of it, of course. But people would want to know, well, specifically, what is it? What is what is it that? We should be campaigning. Well, what are the injustices in relation to, to, to uh, uh, the struggle of women and the, and the struggle of, for for uh, the emancipation of women? Uh, that is. A well, I guess. Yeah, I guess it's targeting um, women of color, uh, women who come from minority communities, targeting sex workers, targeting trans women, and also the. Um, um, Mistreatment of women in prisons. Uh, we know a lot of rape goes on there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. W one of the interesting uh, comments made by a Kenyan who we interviewed a few days ago, uh, Gasheke Gashi, uh, who 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 works in in the in one of the largest slums in Nairobi. Uh, and where the government has has decided that uh, there is no movement, there's close down of everything uh, from seven o'clock in the evening till five o'clock in the morning. Uh, how that affects uh, um, protection against COVID, I don't know. But the point he made was, for most slum dwellers, being uh, in... Uh, having this kind of curfew is like being in prison. That is to say that you're let out during the day so you can get a bit of sun, but in the evening, it's locked down. So, so should we be considering also these kind of populations? We have no housing, no uh, uh, often no water, nothing, um, uh, who are shack dwellers. And this is true in almost every city, uh, certainly in Africa. Um, should we be considering these people as as part of the the incarcerated uh, people, uh, Frida? Yes, absolutely. In fact, this issue of the lockdown is so critically important to talk about because uh, in face of COVID nineteen, so many, uh, even some leftist intellectuals, are saying, for example, that 
what the Chinese government did in imposing the strict lockdown was effective and it should be praised for that. But the fact is, and of course, India, now you mentioned uh, Nairobi and other places too that have done that. Uh, when they, they lock people down, they don't give them access to food and water. So they're basically letting them die in their homes at prisons or in their neighborhoods. Uh, they're making that part of the population expendable. And uh, what, what we've been arguing among uh, some of the Alliance Socialist Feminists, the broader men of Socialist Feminists that we can reach out to is that and uh, we need to advocate the kind, uh, a democratic grassroots a way of organizing, testing, contact tracing, and uh, isolating people uh, in a way that brings together ordinary people, grassroots people, healthcare professionals, educators, in a way that effectively addresses the spread of COVID-19, but not in a, a, an authoritarian way, because the authoritarian, authoritarian way, even when it's supposedly effective, it's at the expense of killing people, imprisoning people, and then imposing these uh, authoritarian standards and having them remain uh, for the future, which is very, uh, uh, very um, uh, scary about the future of humanity. I mean, one, one of the things that is coming up in a number of countries, both in the West and elsewhere, and indeed this morning I was speaking to a Palestinian uh, about this situation, that one of the effects of, of lockdown is to create domestic stress and, and a huge rise mm -hmm. in uh, violence uh, against women. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, domestic violence, as well as violence against uh, uh, against children. Mm -hmm. um, Lara, um, would you like to sort of comment more on, on that aspect? Yes, I can say that whenever there is a crisis, whether it's economic or natural, uh, cases and domestic uh, based and domestic gender based violence increases. But in this case, uh, the lockdown means being confined in a space with a potential abuser. Uh, there was a statistic in Turkey that said 72.8% of femicides happen at home. And we have witnessed a double or maybe triple of uh, cases um, in Lebanon. There also have been maybe, uh, I think, 60% rise in calls um, uh, for gender-based violence in France as well. Wow, wow. So, so yes. yes, sorry, carry on. No, 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 that was it. Yeah, no, I, and, and, and it, th that to me does suggest that that, that is a, a very serious socialist feminist issue. But, I, but I, I really like what you said, Frida, in that, in that the way in which the, the, uh, the pandemic is dealt with in most countries, uh, it gives no agency to, 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 the population. Uh, and it, it's the task of the set specialists uh, or, or the state, uh, mm -hmm. which I think is prob problematic in, in itself. Um, and I mean, uh, yesterday when I spoke to uh, uh, somebody from Cuba, what was interesting was the degree in which uh, in each of the uh, uh, communities, uh, cells that they call them, they are uh, they actually involve people directly in looking after each other in 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 support, and they have a medic who comes round uh, and a nurse comes round and visits everyone in their their local uh, community. Um, is that a strategy you think we should be following? Sounds yes, that sounds exactly like what we need to be following. Although I I mean I the Cuban government itself has not been exactly very democratic. But, but what you're ex describing actually sounds exactly like what we need to be discussing. And this needs to be done through local and national and international councils. So, um, and it is, this is really a great opportunity for that kind of effort to happen on a local, national and, and global scale. So I think we should be putting the word out there and say, this is what we need. A question to either of you. Do you know of other examples of this that could be popularized? Uh, 
Um, I read earlier uh, a group of refugees have repurposed a craft store and are making. Oh, we've, oh dear, I think we've lost Lara. It is argued that South Korea, for instance, has been good or Germany, but again, those are state efforts. Yes. And uh, what, yes, so what we're talking about is, uh, is a grassroots effort um, and bringing together healthcare professionals and educators. I mean, it's not to deny that there, that, that a, there is a role for the state to be held accountable. To, mm -hmm. uh, of course, but, of course. Yeah. Um, Oh dear, sorry, we've lost uh, Lara. Uh, I hope she'll come back in. Uh, yes, for instance, at this point in the United States, uh, I, as you know, a Trump administration is pushing us to go back to work, and and Trump is sending out those insane tweets saying, "Liberate Minnesota, liberate Alabama, go out and party and be act like everything is normal," uh, and and really throwing people to their deaths by doing that. Uh, but uh, uh, then, then uh, when some of the governors have told him that we need, we need testing, we need massive testing in order to even take the next step toward normalization, at first he argues the tests are available, then he says it's up to the state. So we have in the United States at this point, we have a complete, complete mess. Uh, in Iran, if I may add, uh, concerning COVID-19, the state uh, denied that it was an epidemic up until the end of February when the World Health Organization said Iran had the highest rate of, 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 of uh, the epidemic after China. And then they had to admit and they took some measures, but near uh, very mild measures. They, they never really uh, stopped the businesses from operating. Um, a lot of people stayed at home. And then as of last week, the uh, Rouhani uh, government has announced that no life should go back to normal. Biz all businesses sh that closed should restart. So it's, it's absolute madness. And it, Iran has a very high rate of the epidemic. It has the uh, latest figures are 84,000. Uh, known uh, cases of COVID-19 and 5,200 deaths. And of course, we know that they hide the real figures. So that's another example of a disaster. Yeah. Welcome back, Lara. Sorry, we lost you for a moment. No problem. Let me pose a question to you. And what I think a lot of people are recognizing is, is that it's not that uh coronavirus is creating a new situation it's helping us to understand much better the nature of inequalities the nature of exploitative capital it, the nature of colonialism the nature of incarceration and so on and so forth this is an opportunity for building all kinds kinds of alliance in a, in a sense uh the days of single issue campaigns uh, I would suggest maybe waning. This is a time for all kinds of uh, um, alliances to to be built. Um, now, I, I don't doubt at all the importance of a of a global prison abolitionist movement, um, but but is this not a, a a potential problem in in creating uh, yet another um, uh, uh, issue based uh, campaign? Either of you, uh, Lara, do you want to have a go at that? Yeah, okay, but is it really issue based? I mean, we're trying to uh, establish a global network. We're trying to establish a global solidarity that includes a um, a class analysis that includes women mm -hmm. that includes. Uh, minorities into the conversation but we're also including refugees i mean i think this is a gateway i think it's it's a portal to establishing other connections so so what what do you foresee how 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 do you see building this into something more substantial in that sense uh frida you want to answer that or? sure and i would also like to add a little bit to your uh in response to the to your earlier question so answer all. uh so, uh, yes, I agree Sorry. that 
Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yes, I agree that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic really lays bare the contradictions of capitalism. And I think what's extremely important for us to... Sorry. In saying that it lays bare the contradictions of capitalism, I think it's important for a socialist to say that it lays bare the contradictions both of private capitalism and state capitalism. Yeah. Because China, where the virus first emerged, is a state capitalist society. And look at how the Chinese government de dealt with it in a totally authoritarian way and first trying to hide it. So whether you have private or state capitalism, both still follow the logic of capital, which is that human beings are expendable and the logic of capital and the expansion of value as an end in itself is the goal of society. So um, having said that, I think that um, I don't see uh, this uh, effort toward the global prison abolitionist campaign really only as a single issue campaign. I see it as, a, as an issue uh, focused upon which allows us to deal with universal issues. The coming together of capitalist authoritarianism, racism, sexism, homophobia, and, and actually forces us to work in an international way. Uh, it also allows us to, by for instance, breaking the division between political prisoners and, and common prisoners, it allows us to bring together intellectuals and a working class. Uh, the prison population is mostly working class and the people who are involved in prison abolitionism are also the families of the prisoners. So it's a really, I think it's a really, uh, specific and at the same time uh, profound way of relating to working class struggles and, and being intersectional. Um, and then as far as the next steps are concerned, well, after publishing the article in Spectre Journal, uh, we had a, uh, a, an online uh, live stream Facebook panel that took place on Sunday with uh, Romal and Ralston, was a U.S. prison abolitionist activist and herself was a prisoner for 23 years in California. Um, we had Joseph Dyer, who's a Syrian uh, activist and author, and Sina Zekavaj, who's Iranian socialist activist. And we tried to really de de delve deeper into the, the issues and why we need a global movement. And now we're calling for a meeting of those who organized the panel or those who are interested and uh, we're really taking the further steps in by having that kind of global dialogue uh, between the prison abolitionists. So if any, there's anyone who's interested, they're welcome to contact Lara and me. Well, that's great. I mean, it's, it, I mean, you're to be complimented for the fact that at least the, the Middle East and North African uh, socialists are trying to, to, to develop uh, a, a global movement. Uh, but what is your strategy for reaching out to uh, those which are not part of the Middle East or North Africa? Uh, Lara? Um, I think we're trying to connect with uh, Chinese uh, socialists as well as socialists from the States, from Chile as well. Um, for now, I think we're trying to establish these connections. Yes, in fact, for the meeting, upcoming meeting, we're gonna have Chinese and Brazilian and uh, US and, and other uh, Middle Eastern and, and other Latin American uh, and African, uh, African socialist activists. So oh, it's a yeah. global effort, it's not <laughs> just the men are <laughs> um, But um, the, 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 the other thing about the, um, the, the, the epidemic uh, is that it not only reveals things which often are not have not been that clear that clears the, the the veil from our eyes to understand the nature of the societies we live in but but it's also a uh, potentially a time of of uh us creating uh, a new world um and and i i just want to quickly read out uh, a, um, a couple of last paragraphs of a, of a really interesting uh, uh, essay by Arundhati Roy 
in which she writes, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine a world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And she goes on, we can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. She is so good at this, these words. Uh, or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. So, so how do we create that new, new, new world? Uh, one is okay. That you are campaigning for an abolition, but, but we must be trying to build something today, surely, uh, because otherwise, others will build it for us. Your views on that? Who would you like to answer? Uh, you want to start? Me? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think you know within the crisis, it's clear that some authorities will try to exploit it to further their political agenda. But this is also a time for us to move into building, building connections of mutual aid. But for me, I think what we can really harness is reclaiming our time, uh, reclaiming the time that we devoted towards work. So it's a time now for, to demand shorter working weeks. Um, Yes, yes, I would say just re reclaiming our time can be can be the motto. Okay, and Frida? I think we need to have global uh, dialogues on alternatives to capitalism, and not in general, but very specific dialogues. For instance, alternatives to capitalism when it comes to workers' councils. When we talk about changing uh, um, a capitalist mode of production. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of it from a Marxist standpoint uh, uh, on the question of overcoming, not only getting rid of private ownership of the means of production, but actually transcending alienated labor. How do we do that? If that means workers' councils and control of production, what does that mean? So we need to have dialogues on that. We need to have dialogues on what alternatives to capitalism, a humanist alternative to capitalism means in terms of the environment, uh, changing our relationship to nature um, and uh, uh, overcoming uh, or addressing the climate uh, change issue. Uh, we need to address the humanist alternative in terms of healthcare. We need to address it in terms of gender relations uh, and uh, family and if we have all those dialogues, I think we'll have a better sense of what this alternative to capital or human, from what my perspective, a humanist alternative to capitalism uh, can mean. But we cannot do that without a global dialogue. I think we have a lot of good ground. I still think that there's a lot in Marx that we can build on. And some Marxist thinkers since then um, and uh, there's a lot in feminist theory or social feminist theory that we can build on in race theory or anti-racist uh, ideas. Um, idea, and, uh, as far as environment, healthcare, there's a lot we, that's been discussed, but we, we need a lot more. Uh, so we need to get beyond limiting our vision to just getting rid of neoliberalism and then moving on to state capitalism. Let's Let's do away with this view that state capitalism, even benevolent state capitalism, is the answer. It's not the answer. It's the problem. Well, uh, some people would argue that it's, it's, it doesn't work that way, that you can't uh, don't do the thinking first and then uh, get the answers, but that, that it is by engaging in struggles that we learn how to think. Uh, and... There's a very interesting initiative. Um, uh, Kali Akuno, who we we interviewed uh, uh, about a week ago um, uh, from Jackson, Mississippi, uh, Corporation Jackson and a many and a number of other organisations are calling for a uh, a whole 24-hour um, meeting, 24-hour Zoom meeting on the first of May. Uh, the, the workers' day, and uh, with the idea that that this 
opens up a discussion about organizing a general strike, uh, not just in the US, but potentially in other parts of the world. Uh, and I know they would be very keen to have you involved in the discussions of that kind, because I think the reach into uh, the Middle East and North Africa would be really important, as well as these other countries that you are beginning to open up. So I hope that you will consider uh, participating in that uh, uh, that one day forum of how to organize, how to build a general strike, including rent strikes, including uh, refusal to uh, uh, to go to work upon the dangerous conditions and so on. Um, but, Actually, I am. I am part of that effort already. Great. I haven't been invited to be part of the 24-hour uh, dialogue, but yes, I am part of the general strike uh, organizing effort. Great, great. Well, uh, a, a notice should go out very shortly from from Kali about about the the 24-hour uh, meeting. Um, so it will be great to see you there then. <laughs> I yes. Well, listen, I want to thank you both. Are there any other particular issues you would like to table before we end, end the program? Just that we truly thank you for this opportunity. No, well, thank you for taking time for to join us, uh, and uh, as well as you, Lara. Um, thank you. And, and I hope we'll have uh, further opportunities to, to interact. Uh, thank you for joining us. I wish you well and keep safe. You too. Likewise. Okay. Uh, that was uh, Frida Afari and, and Lara, Lara al Kateb uh, speaking to us uh, about the work that they're doing uh, toward a, a global prison abolitionist movement in the time of COVID-19. Uh, thank you for joining us today and uh, we look forward to your participation in our forthcoming uh, events. Tomorrow we'll be speaking to a Dalit poet, Chandra Mohan S, who uh, has written the most beautiful uh, collection of poetry uh, uh, entitled uh, Love After Babel. And we've got him uh, tomorrow to speak to us about love after Babel and COVID. 19. So I hope you will join us then. This is Firoz Manji signing off for today. Uh, and thank you for participating in this podcast.